Welcome to Heart Mindify. Before we start the show, just a reminder to share, rate, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening to it. And please give us a five star rating. It helps us beat the big tech algorithms. I'm John Izzy. Change can be difficult for a lot of us, but when we understand what makes us tick, we develop a better understanding of who we are and begin a journey of discovering our best self. Join me for a free session at johnizzy.com. And I'm Kim Cordy, creator of the Emotion Chef Framework, an emotion management tool. Thoughts drive emotions and emotions drive thoughts, but it's our emotions that drive our decisions and behaviors. Find out more at kimcordy.com. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Knowing each other personally and socially for the past 10 years, Kim and John have joined forces, bringing years of experience and training providing a platform for growth and personal development, along with a little humor. John is the heart, Kim is the mind, and together they are Heart Mindified. Hey Kim, how are you today? I'm okay, John. How are you? Well, you know, I'm doing okay. To our listeners, Kim and I typically record our show that airs on Saturdays on Mondays. But this week, Monday didn't work out. Tuesday was postponed until Wednesday. So I was thinking if it had anything to do with today's topic. There's been a lot of heat coming from all sides of the issues. And I sit here today and I wonder if I really want to record today's episode. And I say that, Kim... Not because I'm worried about what others think, but because I truly feel like so many others probably do, that my words will get lost in the message and immediately get categorized to a specific political affiliation and then grouped together for better or for worse when the intent is not party driven, but driven by humanity. So I don't know, Kim, how I'm doing really. Well, I I just have to say, I can't agree with you more. In fact, Andrew, my husband, was concerned about the same thing. He's like, if you talk about this, you're going to get lumped into a category, which is not our intent. It's just a message that we want to share with people, and it can get lost or categorized. Yeah, and that's my fear. And so I don't know. I mean, I'm feeling okay, but... I tell you, these past couple of weeks have really taken an emotional toll on me and has forced me to really evaluate who I am as a person and how other people perceive me as a person. And what does that mean? So I don't know. That's where I am today. For me, this brought up an old Toastmaster speech that I gave. I actually was in contests and won. For me, this has taken me back. What is my favorite word? John, what's your favorite word? Do you have one? Yeah, it's compassion. Compassion. Mine is why. Ah. I grew up in a very strict religion. You didn't really ask why much. And I ask why all the time. And it's because of why that I progressed to making the emotion chef. After a very brutal mass shooting, which we've had so many that it's, I can't tell you exactly which one it was. I asked, why would somebody want to do this? It's the same question that I had is why did that cop put his knee on that poor man's neck till he died? Yeah. Yeah. I gave a speech because of that question, why? And in that speech, I started out describing a man. So I'm going to describe him to you. Okay. A budding lawyer, handsome, charming, bright. He's the assistant to the governor of Washington, 
a volunteer at a suicide hotline. His co-workers described him as a skilled volunteer who helped ease troubled callers and actually saved lives. Hmm. So to the audience, I just said, hey, who here, if given an opportunity, would either share a meal or want to have coffee with him? And most raised their hand. Would you? Yeah, definitely. Right? I told them his name, Ted Bundy. <laughs> These are true descriptions of Ted Bundy. And for those of you who don't know who Ted Bundy is, he's an infamous serial killer who, from the 1970s, who was known for kidnapping, raping, and murdering. They know for sure 36, but they think that it's over 100 women. Wow. So would you still want to have coffee? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) of course i would (laughs) you're the only one every audience i've ever given this speech to said no (laughs) (laughs) but how your feelings can go from positive to negative just with words right absolutely so couldn't it work the opposite couldn't we overcome hate by using different words yeah i totally agree with that Well, it's not a visual cue that makes us hate. It's being given information. If if it were visual cues, then blind people wouldn't be prejudiced, correct? That's correct. There's a guy who wrote a book. He he said, blinded by sight, seeing race through the eyes of the blind. And Mr. Obasogi did some studies. And he said that we are all socialized to see race. It's only by talking to blind people that we get a true understanding of how strong that socialization practice is. The study that he performed highlighted how the things that we think are obvious are often things that society works very, very hard to teach us. What do you think about that? Do you see that? Do you agree? Yeah, I actually do agree with that. That's a really good, I have to think about that because that's a really good way of, of looking at racial differences based on other things besides sight, right? Because that is deeply rooted in our fabric as a society that it goes beyond just recognizing it through sight. You know it's there. You know it's real. Well, if you think about it from the aspect of an emotion culturist who developed the Emotion Chef program, it's an emotion recipe. So societally, it's an old family recipe that was created that says this combination of circumstances gives me this emotional response. And what we have been taught societally, some experientially, but mostly through society, are emotional responses. So we learn to hate. It's not born in us. That I totally agree with. So it's it's a matter for me of changing that recipe or or doing that. For me... And this is how I pulled together this speech that I gave was that we have some inherent things as humans. That's just how we are. First is that we like to form groups and we have what's called positive distinctiveness. So we have our in-groups and we have favoritism. So we feel better about our in-group by degrading the out-group. And its simplest form, just take a football game and you've got the two teams that's easy right just to say oh yes i'm i'm pro 49ers and you know raiders boo and everybody hates dallas (laughs) i I was just gonna say and dallas too (laughs) because i i think your team doesn't like dallas either right (laughs) no no one does even the people that like dallas don't like dallas (laughs) well i want to say i'm joking here But you get my point, right? Like that that's that's part of how we are, like our tribe, our group. So the the more distinct we make our in-group, the bigger our out-group. 
which makes it more difficult for you to not feel picked on. And then there's social comparison, which by comparing to someone else makes you feel better about yourself. They actually, in a study, they took people, gave them fake feedback, told them they were unattractive, and then said, now rate these people and gave them pictures. And when they did that, they rated them as less attractive, but also less intelligent and less kind. So you can see this combination of wanting to feel better about yourself, which we all do, right? Like we don't want to feel negative about ourselves. So how do we do that? We pick on others. So we can either pick on individuals or our out group. So honestly, it's really insecurity over ourselves that is driving a lot of the cruelty in the world. Wondering what you think about that, John. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think you're right on. It's funny because the first thing that comes to mind when you're talking about that is a level of hierarchy that exists in all cultures, right? And under that hierarchy are are people that are grouped together. And under that group are people that are grouped together. And that goes to society in general, and that goes to the business world as well. So where you have your CEOs, and then you have your you know, your entry level positions where there's this superiority or this hierarchy that exists, which only becomes wrong for a lack of better words, but it only becomes wrong when it is pointed out in a discriminatory way. And I think we've gotten accustomed to that. Look at all the hazing that goes on on college campuses. Look at all the how members treat new members to a group. It's almost accepted. And I think that's a problem in and of itself. Well, let's look at it in other ways. I mean, a college educated person is looked at much more highly than a tradesperson. Yes. Right? Although I think the tide is turning on that, but I think you're right. They are. It may be turning, but that is a long way to go. Yeah. But why? Because for so long, it was only the rich and the elite that had education. Mm -hmm. Um, Da Vinci did not get a formal education. Leonardo da Vinci couldn't get a formal education because he was the bastard son of some really rich guy. So all of his half siblings would be educated. And of course, if they were male, They got an education and he didn't. And yet he is one of the most brilliant minds to ever walk this earth. Mm -hmm. So there's this lack of respect. And Albert Einstein said, and if anyone is an, you know, is a great mind, Albert Einstein is one of the all time great minds. He said, I speak to everyone in the same way, whether he's the garbage man or the president of a university. Wouldn't that make a difference in how we talk to others? Oh, absolutely. So this goes back to my emotion recipes and our emotions, how we feel about ourselves or others, it regulates our thoughts. So my idea, this has been my, my not very well pursued, but my grand idea is to change the world one thought at a time, mm. to change the tide on racism, elitism, these ways in which we feel better about ourselves by putting someone else down. What if we made someone feel better about themselves by finding something they like about them instead of something that they didn't like, finding something where they had something in common rather than a difference? If Everyone took one negative thought and turned it around by finding something positive about another individual or group. One thought could turn into many thoughts, and that could be the one boil that starts to boil the ocean. That's my idea. No, I like that a lot. I mean, we're 99.9% genetically related to everyone on the earth. There, we're all R-D-N-A. family. But no, we are all family. And do we need to have some alien race come down and and attack the earth for us all to unite as humans? Right? I mean, like, and, and we are so behind socially, when you look at all the technology advancements that we've made, and yet, 
socially, we are still behind. We are not advancing mentally and emotionally like we are technologically. I say that because Andrew and I were talking about it. And he said, do you ever see in any of those futuristic systems where like on Star Trek, where they're all traveling out in space, do they ever say, oh, I'm a human from California and I lived in this state, in this city, (laughs) and I was a part of this religion and this was my sexual preference and this was my political preference. No, they just say, oh yeah, we're humans. We're from earth. And that's maybe what we need to get to. Anyway, I just want to say this is my take on all of this. I know that it it's been boiled down to to a horrible treatment of the the African American, actually the black community of the earth. But they're not alone. And I'm not I'm not trying to disregard the pain and the suffering that's going on, but it's it's going on everywhere in different forms. So if we can just change how we think, which takes me to my last quote, and then I'm going to hand it over to you because I I, I know you have a lot to say on this, but Henry David Thoreau said a single footstep will not make a path on the earth. So a single thought will not make a pathway in the mind to make a deep physical path. We walk again and again to make a deep mental path. We must think over and over the kinds of thoughts we wish to dominate our lives. And if you want your thoughts to be ones of hate, that's not good for you. And it's not good for humans or humanity. No, it is not. Now I know you've had, that's kind of my mind approach to this, right? You see how I, I drove towards this. It's all, thoughts in mind. Let's all take the technical path because yeah, that's how I go. (laughs) But I know my dear John, I want to hear your heart on this matter. Well, Kim, I'm going to surprise you a little bit. Oh, I'm excited. Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Because when we first discussed doing this episode, I physically had to put my feelings aside and treat it as academia, right? I had to use my head. (laughs) One would think I would be all heart, but in this particular case, I had to use my head because I had to discover what other people see and what doctrines are being written on race discrimination. And that's what I immediately went to. I went to human rights campaigns, race discrimination on equality. So I read it, and here's what it says. There are four types of discrimination. The first is direct discrimination, which this happens when someone treats you worse than another person in a similar situation because of your race. So for example, if a landlord did not rent you an apartment based on your race, this would be direct race discrimination. And then there's indirect discrimination. And this happens when an organization has a particular policy or way of working that puts people of your racial group at a disadvantage. So, for example, a hairdresser, one that cuts hair, refuses to employ a stylist that covers their hair. This would put any Muslim woman or Sikh men who cover their hair at a disadvantage when applying for a position as a stylist. And sometimes indirect race discrimination can be permitted if the organization or employer can show that there is a good reason for discrimination. So this is known as objective justification. And what that means is, let's say a Romanian Romanian asylum leader tries to open a bank account, but the bank states that to be eligible, you need to have been a resident in the U.S. for 12 months and have a permanent address. The Romanian man is not able to open the bank account. The bank would need to prove that its policy was necessary for business reasons, such as to prevent fraud, and that there was no practical alternative. The third one is one that hits home to me in a lot of ways, and that's harassment. So, Harassment occurs when someone makes you feel humiliated, offended, 
or degraded because of your race. For example, a young black man at, a, at work keeps being called a racist name by his colleagues. His colleagues say it's just banter, but the employee is insulted and offended by it. Harassment, Kim, can never, ever, ever be justified. And then number four is victimization. This is when you're mistreated because you have made a complaint of race-related discrimination under the Equality Act. It can occur if you are supporting someone who has made a complaint of race-related discrimination. For example, the young man in the example above wants to make a formal complaint about his treatment. His manager threatens to fire him unless he drops the complaint. So in short... I agree with everything that was just read, right? So I had to read that to make sure that what side do I stand on, right? And on the surface, it seems good. But it's only effective if we as a society are held accountable, which typically we are not. We gravitate, and you mentioned this, we gravitate toward like-minded individuals meaning we associate with people that we typically agree with. In doing so, we or my group might have a different set of rules about harassment that don't agree with the definition. But it does agree with what a particular group says it does. Do you follow me so far? Oh, I'm very, very, very close. I understand you perfectly. All right. So we are faced with a problem, right? Your Mm -hmm. definition is different than mine. And mine should be respected just like yours. And if not, then why is yours better? Or why should I live by it when I don't agree with it? My point is this. The problem is because a group of people think that harassment in their circle is okay. And because of that, they teach their young and foster an ongoing alliance with each other. And that's carried down from generation to generation until it becomes socially unacceptable and is a direct is in direct contrast with the human condition and violates the very fabric of who we are by the pigmentation in our skin and not by who we are from the common DNA that runs throughout our bodies, which defines our race, the human race. So when we're left with it, it's not racial discrimination Let's call it what it is. It's bigotry and hate, and that can only be derived from ignorance. Exactly. And and you're you're you, we're touching on a lot of the same points just as usual coming at it yep. from a different <laughs> direction, right? We we it's thoughts. It's what we're taught, it's it's how we think. And if you think about the current day subject of racism against black Americans. Mm -hmm. It is in the fabric of society for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Oh yeah. Slavery back in the day was common. You took over a village, you took over a country, you know, they didn't really have big countries like we do now. So you would take over a village Anybody who could work your fields, you took as a slave, everybody else you killed. The word slaves comes from the uh, the Slavic group. The Germans took so many of them as slaves that Slav became slave. Yep. It's, it's just, it was an awful practice, but it was an economic one. And so while we have gotten rid of slavery, the fabric of society and the recipe or whatever you want to call it, like you said, it still exists because people look and think that they are better than other people or they deserve this or I deserve better or you can't do this. Just like you said, their group making up rules. It's in some ways, if you were to just rise above it all and look down, you'd think, wow, what a silly group of people. Yeah. No, I agree. I totally agree. You know, I pushed my heart aside for a moment to really allowed and really allowed my brain to take over in a way where I needed to 
make sense of it from an intellectual standpoint. Right. And then, and then my heart, then, then my heart gave in. Then my heart said, "Uh uh-uh, you're not getting away with it that easy. And so if you don't mind, I've got some thoughts from a heart perspective of what all of this means to me. Please. Okay. Of course, I I, I depend on your heart. (laughs) You're the heart of this show. So after I went through all of that study, I still didn't understand why I haven't been able to sleep at night. Right. I still didn't understand why my emotions are so torn and why I feel like I've been hit in the stomach over and over and over again. And I'm going to tell you why. Kim, many people I've heard recently are asking if George Floyd's death is a turning point for the U.S. and other countries around the world, if something will really change. But rather than asking this passive question, we need to be asking ourselves how we are going to help make this a turning point. Because if it's going to be a turning point, right, we've got to make it one. So how do we do that? For a lot of people, it's a question of where we start, right? How do I do something more meaningful than just post on social media and cause outrage, right? Based on my opinion or my political party. Or how do I avoid simple virtue signaling? Or maybe I ask the question if I should even enter the conversation. And that's what I said in the beginning, right? I'm thinking that's a lot of us. Do we really even want to put our necks out there? Because in this type of an environment, it's going to get cut off. So, Two things happened recently that came to mind. One was a time period that I had in the past and then my participation in the protest. So let me talk about the first one first. I remember working at a local community center in downtown Cleveland, Ohio. And Kim, I don't think I've told you this either. This was when I was studying to be a Franciscan. So I still had to go to college and get a degree. And that was that time period. I grew up, though, in an area that was not void of necessities, right? So I was accustomed to black, brown, white, and other people. In many ways, working at the community center in downtown Cleveland kind of burst my bubble of white privilege. That wasn't a term you heard of often, if ever. I mean, this was 1986 or so. So that wasn't a term that was talked about all the time. This was a community that cared about its children and supported one another. It was a multi-ethnic area where black, Latino, and white residents live side by side. It was also the first time I truly understood the massive inequities between these kids and me as a child. I couldn't help but feel lucky to have been raised in my environment. I was aware of the homelessness and the poor, but this was the first time I knew families struggling with homelessness or kids going home to empty houses because their parents worked multiple jobs to make ends meet, or weren't at home at all. It was the first time and probably the most impactful, Kim, when I saw a young black man, or a young black child, rather, drop to the ground. Wow. As I saw a young black child drop to the ground as a police car drove by. Now, remember, this is 1986, demonstrating for me the lack of trust between minorities and the police. This is real life. And not much has changed in 34 years in these communities. Uh, You know, racism is systemic in the U.S. It's baked into the structures of society that govern our lives. But here's the point. Systems are created by people. And people have the power to change them. So you ask the question, what can you do? The answer is to start with what we do in our day-to-day lives. And this goes back to what you said. How do we act towards people who look differently from us, right? What are we doing to help dismantle systems and beliefs that are racist? We need to have uncomfortable conversations, Kim. Even Even when emotions are overwhelming. Listen, listen, listen to each other. 
What are your friends and family saying when a black or brown or white person leaves your presence? Does it turn racist? Do you say things like, see, I have a black friend or a white friend. If you know something or someone that needs to be informed or challenged, engage in that conversation with them. Support those that are working for change on a government level. But the main point is to change your rhetoric, and you mentioned this. I have a lot of ethnic friends, and I know, Kim, you do too, and that's probably because we both lived in major U.S. cities for years. Ask yourself, what is the point of describing someone by the color unless you are reporting a crime? Seriously, is it really necessary to say a nice black girl started at the office today or he's a handsome Hispanic? Why does it have to be a black girl or a Hispanic man? Why can't it just be a nice girl and a handsome man? If you're white, how many times have you heard someone say, she's pretty for a black girl? How disgusting is that statement? And some people might say, John, really? Come on. But I say to them, ask yourself, if by describing someone by their color lifts them up or keeps them down. Small changes like this make a huge difference. I said a lot there. What do you think? When I was raised, let's talk about like, our our experiences really are all that we can lean upon, right? right? I was raised in a very strict religion and race was never a topic. I I went to school with a bunch of kids that were from Persian, Chinese, Hispanic. I mean, it was all over the place. It was a very mixed group of kids. I never, ever once paid attention to that. There was a couple of things that I had to pay attention to based on how I was raised. One was their religion. Mm. If you weren't in the same religion... That's not good. And you don't hang out with them. So there was something wrong. The other thing, and I can remember this as clear as day. We lived in the San Francisco Peninsula, just below San Francisco. And and my dad took us all up. My parents took us all up to Golden Gate Park to play. There's a big playground there, huge grassy area. We're playing And all of a sudden, my dad's like, get in the car, get in the car, everybody get everything like we're going in the car. There were some people who, you know, this was in the 70s, they were kind of quote unquote hippie (laughs) and looked different. And, and everything was based on, well, they're not well dressed, you know, they they're, they're dressed like this. So you had to run. And I was always kind of like, oh, like if someone was really different looking, it, it always put me off. When I came up with this idea for myself, really, of trying to find something in positive and in another person so that you can overcome something that you've got in your head, uh-huh. I I remember being at Trader Joe's and there was a guy there and he had one of those big discs in his ear. I forget what they call those, but it was gigantic. And I'm like, oh, like normally the- the They're called gauges. 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 Thank you, John. Gauges. (laughs) Yeah. He had a gigantic gauge and I looked at it and I could feel that, you know, that little Uh emotion coming up, this judgy emotion. And, And then I just said, hey, how long did it take you to get that gigantic thing in your ear? I go, that looks really painful. <laughs> now, fair question. Now, it was a fair question. Yep. I took an I took an interest, and he explained it to me. Wow. He had such joy in his face when he was explaining it to me, and that I took an interest in what was something that was important to him. And I said, "Well, I commend you. I don't." have what it takes to do something like that. So good for you that this is what you wanted and you were able to endure the pain to get there. And he was so happy. And I'm like, this is awesome because I just felt better about the whole big gauge in the ear. And then I sound like a really old woman 
but it's just how I'm raised. Yeah, I'm kind of old. But but the point is, is that he also felt good. Like he was so excited. So then I started noticing when I had negative feelings about someone, I just said, find something I sincerely liked, not to be placating. But if I saw something and I just thought that is fantastic. So I would compliment them on what I liked. Your eyes are amazing and not focusing on the negative. And then what happened for me is that part of me that was always looking at the negative was starting to look for the positive in people. Like I was starting to notice all the things I liked, not the direct natural way of going to what I didn't like or what was different. And it made the other people feel better about themselves. So if insecurity about yourself is what's driving some of this hatred in the world and this miseducation by refocusing and sharing what you find, you can make a difference. And and that's a small difference. Like if you can't have the conversation, which is where I think people need to go, but not everybody can do that, then you can make a little change in yourself just by doing that. And nobody has to know that you're trying to change yourself, right? In fact, um, there's a great story about this this uh, African-American gentleman who has convinced 200 Ku Klux Klan members to give up their robes. And he did it all with conversation. It all started in a bar. Some guy made some stupid comment like, oh, well, it's in your, your gene to be violent and to do this. And the guy said, well, I'm not violent. And he said, oh, it's a latent gene. It just hasn't come out yet. And he said, well, then I guess... Be- I know, right? And we think it's stupid, but he believed it. So you cannot, you can't disrupt people's yeah. honest belief that it's true. So you just can't. No. And then he responded, well, you know, you must be a serial killer because all serial serial killers are white. Like if you look at that, John Wayne Gacy, I mean, the list goes on. And he said, well, I'm not a serial killer. And he goes, well, he goes, not yet. He goes, it's just a latent gene. And so it kind of proved the point. But but my point is, is that you are so right by having these conversations, by being open and honest, it can lead to that point. But sometimes we have to move the we have to move ourselves a little closer to being able to have the conversation. And and I think that the idea of just starting to try and change your negativity can be a start. You know, I agree with you. And I'm going to try right now to (laughs) see if I can change just one person out there. Because I think it's important that we do our part. And I've got something I want to share. And hopefully it'll resonate with one person, right? Because that's all it really takes is just one person. So as you know... You and I talked, well, you didn't know until I was there, but you knew that I was going or that I went to the protest in D.C. It was the Saturday after President Trump made an appearance at St. John's with the Bible for a photo opportunity. So it was that Saturday. And I went for a couple reasons. The first reason I went was to show support, right? Because I do believe The second reason I went was to see if the news was actually reporting what was happening or were they only focused on the rioting and the bipartisan political commentary, right? And then the third reason why I went was to talk to people. Of course, that's why I went, was to talk to people, young and old, black and white, just to ask them why they were there. Not to engage politically, but to engage on a human and emotional level. So I realized, Kim, as soon as I got out of my car that I knew the reporting could not even come close to the actual reality of being downtown protesting. I mean, I've been to many protests, and this was by far one of the most peaceful protests. I tell you, the most violent protest I ever witnessed, and I witnessed it when I was um, working in downtown D.C., was the right to life marches. 
the amount of burning down abortion clinics and accosting women as they were going in and coming out was just horrific. And I wasn't even protesting, but I witnessed that one. Um, but I'm getting off the point. So now I'm not ignorant that rioting was taking place, right? I don't want you to think that I'm, I was ignorant to the fact that we are, that, that, that we're having rioting because we were having rioters. But from what I saw that day, there, was, there wasn't any form of violence going on, none. And then I started talking to people. And this is where the beauty happened. I spoke to an older black man, probably in his 70s, who I helped off the curb. And as he grabbed my hand, he said, thank you for coming. And it was genuine. It was, thank you for coming. And I asked him why he was thanking me. And his response was, because I'm getting old and I don't know how much time I have left. And we just walked and talked about life, teaching our youth, not being afraid, racism in general. And as we left, he said, some things have changed, so don't lose hope. And I said, can you tell me one thing that's changed? And he said, you helped me off the curb, and it wasn't because I'm black. It was because you cared. And Kim, I stopped for a second, and I said, wow, I understand. And we left each other. So that was pretty, that was pretty powerful, right? Yeah. The second thing was even more powerful. Another person I talked with was about nine or 10 years old. And he was a young black boy and he had a shirt on that read, I'm part of history. And I knelt down on one knee and I said, hey, buddy, you aren't just part of history. You are history. And he just kind of smiled. And I asked him, when you look into the crowd, what do you see? And he said, people who want to love each other. Think about that for a second. People who want to love each other from a 10-year-old. And honestly, I wiped tears from my eyes. And I looked at his father and I said, you're doing? And he said, no. And I said, nah, you're doing. And that's what fatherhood is about. He wiped then a tear from his eye. So with all the noise that was going on, you know, Kim, around all the rioting and around all the political jargon, these were two real people, very different in age, and their focus was on each other. Their focus was on love. Their focus was on compassion. You know, that makes me think about those words, love and compassion. And they're different, right? Yeah. And I would like to throw respect in there too. Love gets used a lot. Like all you need is love, love, love. You know, there we need to love one another. And there's people I think like me out there, I am very particular with whom I use that word. I... I'm an old, I'm an older woman. And in my life, there's been four men that I've been in relationships with, two of whom I married that I said, I love you too. And so I think that sometimes, and this is just my guessing, that there's people out there like me who don't want to love strangers. They don't want to use that word they feel for them. It's no, they, they, their heart goes out to them and it's more compassion. It's more respect. It's more empathy. And I I just wonder if there are people who are like me, I don't get offended by the word love, but I also don't use that word in these terms or in these situations. It's like, I, this is when I feel compassion. Uh, I feel um, respect. In fact, in my emotion chef program, I talk about labeling and how important it is to have lots of emotion words and use these to label your emotions. And because I'm so funny with the word love, I made up this word respassion. And the meaning of respassion is the combination of respect and 
compassion. And this meaning is concern and sympathetic awareness or tolerance for others, even when you are not in agreement with how they feel, think, believe, or look. What's the word? And my again? point is res passion. Okay. I made it up. This is my word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I can get it in the dictionary, I'd be super happy. I'm gonna say <laughs> that to me. I'm gonna say the meaning again. All right. Concern, concern and sympathetic awareness or tolerance for others, even when you are not in agreement with how they feel, think, believe, or look. Wow, I really like that, Kim. I do too. And it really sums up that feeling I have because the the love that I have is more, more uh, relational to people that I know, to people that I have developed relationships with. You know, I call people sisters of the heart. You're like my brother, right? Like I love <laughs> yeah. you. Um, and, uh, you know, there's other people that I love, but I can't use the word love with a stranger, but I can use rest passion and it still can get the point across and it can still be heartfelt. Wow. No, I really like that. You know, I didn't share these thoughts about the protest or experiences with you and with our listeners because I'm trying to prove a point though. I think there might be a point in there somewhere, but there comes a time when the very rhetoric we choose to use is what defines us as a person. So as I was driving home from that protest, I asked myself this question and then I'm done for the day. I'm not going to talk about this anymore, but I was driving home from the protest. I asked myself this question, politics aside, family aside, friends aside, what do I truly believe? What is in my heart? What do I know in my mind? And what do I feel in my gut? Sound familiar? A tad. <laughs> and what it is, I believe, is this. And I've always believed this. I haven't always lived up to it, but that's because of ignorance on my part. But I've always believed on the side that lifts people up over the side that continues to oppress people. So my challenge is to ask yourself the same question. Politics aside, family aside, friends aside, what do you truly believe? And then, to Kim's point, and here is the key, can those around you agree with your assessment of yourself? And if not, then to Kim's point, ask the question, why? I agree, and I'm just going to add one tiny little point. Please do. Is that you should always question thoughts, especially negative ones. When I talk about recipes. And when I talk about all this stuff, we have and and societal norms that govern how we think and feel. So if you or familial norms, like you said, your, your group that you're in, you believe a certain way because that's the way the group believes. Challenging them to see if they're true is how that man convinced 200 Ku Klux Klan members to give up their robes. He helped them to challenge if what they believed was true, but we don't need someone to do that. We can challenge it ourselves. Why do we think that way? Well, is that thought true? So taking it even one step further yep. to, to respond to the accuracy of our thoughts. Because remember, our emotions are driven by our thoughts and our emotions drive our decisions and behaviors. And I should say thoughts and emotions drive each other, but our decisions and behaviors come from our emotions. If we don't like our decisions and behaviors, if others question our decisions and behaviors, it's coming from your thoughts. And where did that come from? Yeah. Kim and I have been talking about this for weeks now. And um, yeah. we knew that this episode was going to go over 30 minutes. I didn't realize it was going to be close to an hour though. Um, <laughs> but I think it was important to have it go that long because we didn't want to break it up into two shows because you can't have the emotion 
without having the mind. And you can't have the mind without having the emotion. So we need to talk about those two things. And secondly, to our point in the beginning, if we had a second show, would it just get lost in everything that was, you know, that's going on right now and all the commentaries? John, your point about communication earlier uh-huh. and it it needs to be effective communication. Um, we'll talk about this next week, but there's a difference between listening and hearing and there's things that interrupt effective communication. And that's why we're talking about that next week. I think that's a good topic to follow up this conversation. And you know, Kim, in the past seven weeks, we've talked about a lot of things and we've given the listeners and ourselves things to think about. But one of the difficulties we have is being able to communicate our thoughts, being able to communicate our feelings so that they truly reflect what's going on inside of us. So I think this is a great opportunity to explore communication and what that means for us. Right. Because it's a two way, it's a two way street, right? It's what you're saying, but also what the other person is perceiving. And there's things that get in the way of that. Absolutely. And people don't realize communication isn't always what you think it is just because you said it. That's exactly right. This is going to be a good episode too, I think. Yeah, I think so too. Thank you for your thoughts, John. Yeah, Kim, thank you so much for your thoughts as well. And to our listeners, thank you guys so much for hanging in 56 minutes of this. And we really appreciate it. We love the love that you give us all the time. And I love, I love Res Passion. <laughs> you love Res Passion. I have a lot of Res Passion for you. Res Passion. Res Passion. I love that word. All right, everyone, have a great week. And we will catch up with you all next time. So long, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Hello, everyone. After editing this episode, it's important to understand that this topic is a difficult one, surrounded with a lot of emotion and deep-seated personal beliefs. As a result, you might find yourself struggling. Maybe the events that have taken place have caused you to question some of these beliefs. Maybe friends and family have raised other viewpoints that leave you doubting yourself Or maybe you are trying to be more steadfast in what you believe and are having difficulty discovering the meaning behind those beliefs. Whatever you are going through, I want you to know that I offer a judgment-free environment where we can have a safe conversation. If you feel you want to continue the conversation or have other questions not related to this topic but are of concern to you, please go to my website at johnizzy.com and sign up for a free consultation. As a coach, I'm here for you. Enjoy the rest of your day. New shows are available every Saturday right here on heartmindify.podbean.com or wherever you listen. Kim and I would like to thank each and every one of you for allowing us to be a small part of your life. Be kind to yourself and remember, our hearts tell the story, but our mind is the conductor.